committee report. So, you know, there's a small audience, but it will grow because we will do this every single year. And the intent of this meeting is really communicate and educate our community on the different services, not only what we did in the previous year, but where Miners Colfax Medical Center is going in the future. And to make sure we're meeting those needs also. So, as I say, you know, our history of caring and future of promise, that's really our mantra as we're moving forward. And to remind people, not only, you know, because we have a lot of different services, different facilities, we are one organization with one mission and one direction. So tonight what we'll talk about is our mission and values. We're gonna review our pillars, different services we offer, the medical staff, both what we currently have and what we're projected for the future in our recruitment. We're gonna talk about financials for the previous year. Talk about our strategic initiatives that uh, Mr. Paul Jenkins has helped us out with. We're also gonna look at uh, the future of healthcare. We'll talk about our rural health clinic, some behavioral health initiatives. We're also gonna be looking at legislative education and how everybody can participate in that. And Marilyn Wiseman is going to give us a report on what the auxiliary has been doing, the tremendous things they've been doing. Talk also about our medical foundation and answer any questions. So, our mission and our history. Remember, we, are, we were started by funding from the 1898 Ferguson Act. And then in 1910, additional 50,000 acres to create 100,000 acres to help fund this hospital in 1910. Can anyone tell me when the state became, or statehood for New Mexico territory, what year? It was 102 years ago. 1912. 1912. <laughs> you win a prize. There's always prizes, right? So for the Super Bowl, you've got dips and coffee. <laughs> All right. So our mission, the mission of Myers Colfax Medical Center, we are a healthcare agency of the state of New Mexico um, to provide quality acute care, long-term care, and related services to the beneficiaries of that Miners Trust and of New Mexico and the people of Northeastern New Mexico. We serve a very large, large region. We serve you know, miners throughout the entire state of New Mexico, plus we serve people in Southern Colorado because we're the only OB services for over 100 miles. We're the only intensive care unit for over 100 miles. So a lot of rich services there. Our values that we all exemplify, following values that will be incorporated in our organization, those values allow us to proudly be a part of the MCMC organization. And this is what we created about a year and a half ago with the MCMC team created these. It wasn't me coming in and saying these are our values. So again, teamwork. We have to do everything together. We have to communicate effectively, not only with ourselves, amongst ourselves, but with our customers. Quality, everything's driven by providing exceptional quality. Being dependable, not only showing up on time, as I say, but making sure we do what we say we're going to do. And then being honest with everything we do. So just to give a picture so everybody can give or see that, we are at the base. You know, all the team members, the medical staff, our board of trustees, the auxiliary and our foundation help support those six pillars and that's everything we do strives around those six pillars, providing that exceptional quality and service. Committing to people and our team members, investing and growing and educating. Growth, making sure meeting all those service needs and expanding services in areas that there are gaps in. Providing minor services, that again is one of our core founding principles that we can never forget making sure we're meeting those community needs and addressing not just the acute care side. 
and then making sure financially we are strong and viable and that we are sustainable for another 100 plus years. And then that's how we support our customers, family, visitors, and ultimately the service area. Then interwoven in there are those five values that we just talked about that holds everything together. So the organization, just to remind people, again, yeah, we're a 25 bed acute critical care or hospital providing emergency services, surgery services, medical, surgical, ICU or intensive care, obstetrics and women's health, radiology, laboratory with an on-site pathologist. And I say that because for our size organization, that's not the norm. Then we have also respiratory therapy. We have great and expanding outpatient clinics. We have the long-term care facility, which was ranked in the top 10th percentile by our uh, customer service satisfaction and our C picker this previous year, which is a great mark. That provides intermediate and assisted living for not only the miners throughout the state of New Mexico, but also we have 10 non-minor beds there also. And then the Black Lung Respiratory Disease Outreach Program that travels the state. And there are 17 in, or consortiums or people in the consortium throughout the nation that provide these services. Miners Colfax Medical Center is the only one with that mobile semi. Everybody else is a standalone clinic. We are nationally recognized as being the leader in this, which is a tremendous honor uh, and a tribute to Candace, who's right over in the corner. All right, services, things we've done, not only expanding and building on this past year, cardiology. Everybody probably remembers that had to go away for a while as we redid some things with that um, service. They came back approximately six months ago and has really grown. Um, that it, we've really invested a lot with the New Mexico Heart Institute and that has grown a lot and great service. Oncology, again, because we don't want people having to drive all the way to Pueblo or to Santa Fe. So those services, we made sure those are premier services provided right here. We partnered now with the University of New Mexico and working with Dr. Akse Sood, a really nationally known pulmonologist who has done a ton of research, specifically not only in black lung, but advanced respiratory disease. So our partnership with Dr. Sood and UNM is really going to allow us to expand those programs our career pathways because we want to grow and educate and build you know the community here so getting in the schools at the middle school level and helping people develop those career pathways and giving them those new opportunities and we are also a nurse clinical site one of the few in this region to provide that opportunity for those student nurses to come in and gain experience in a lot of different areas and I will also do the physical therapy resident program working with Rocky Mountain um, Therapy where we have access for their students to not only come over here, but we assist with their stay. Future, because we're always looking at that pillar of growth, right? So, respiratory and cardiac, that's a real need in this area to expand. We're really looking at what other services as we look at UNM and what other practitioners we need to bring in to expand those services. Miners services will continue to look as not only we travel the state, but what we do here, not only again for coal dust and black lung, but for uranium and other mining issues. Urology, that's another big need around there, around here. So what we can do to expand and create those clinics for people to come. Podiatry, I know just expanding access to that. Ear, nose, and throat. So having those services, and it's not someone dedicated here, but at least twice a month, and there's a real need. And also orthopedics, because right now people either have to go down to Santa Fe, you know, or up to Springs, or go 
over to touts, which is a burden, not only on the customer, but their family. Then we're also going to be, as I said, expanding our school mentoring program. We have a very successful CNA program, working with junior and seniors in high school, getting them on that career pathway in high school for healthcare. So we're expanding that in other areas of not only clinical, but even in financial or registration and coding, HIM or health information. So important areas that will be growing under the new healthcare model. I want to share our current medical staff. You know, the active who have privileges here at the hospital, Dr. Caruana, our chief of staff, Dr. Condor, Dr. Lopez, Dr. Harlan, Dr. Moore, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Yagel, and Dr. Wright. Our ally is Dr. Carter, who provides medical directorship for our long-term care. He's been an extraordinary partner with us on building new programs over there. In the emergency department, we've really focused trying to make sure, not only now, a couple years ago, they made sure we had 24-hour physician coverage in our ER. We wanted to make sure we got down to a core group. So when people came for their services, we made sure that we have high-quality physicians treating um, patients. So Dr. Amasquita, Dr. Condor, who is our ER medical director, Dr. Belknap, Dr. Smith, Dr. McGrordy, Dr. Um, McClintock, and Dr. Jackson are our core. And we continue to make sure we're providing advanced education. We contract with emergency staffing solutions through Dallas with these physicians. We work partner to make sure that we're providing exceptional care there. Recruitment. We've been extremely active this past year trying to recruit more physicians and practitioners into our area. We've made strides, but we still have a long way to go to make sure we're filling the gaps. The physicians we did recruit this past year, you know, Dr. Lopez, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Harlan, Dr. Wright. For mid-level providers, a Kirsten Adams, who is a nurse practitioner, Vanessa Walker, a nurse practitioner, and Randall Lewis, who's a physician assistant. They are, have signed the agreements and will be joining us this spring and summer also. But we don't stop because still in family medicine, we are still short four providers for this region and based on our service area. Uh, we continue based on our growth, what we want to expand, continue. We need another general surgeon. Right now, we do rely some on locum tenens or temporary fill-in around the two physicians or surgeons we have, and we want to solidify that a little more. But we need to recruit a full-time pulmonologist as we advance our minor services, our respiratory disease, our cardiac and pulmonary programs. Family map medicine, and I say with, W with, OB. So a family medicine practitioner, my preference, who is able to work in the OB area also. And then also look at another OBGYN in women's health as that continues to expand. Remember, we're the only service for that for over 100, so there's a big need to fill there. And then an orthopedic surgeon to make sure we can fill that need also. Financials, everybody wants to know our financials, right? Where we stand. <laughs> Um, these are, you know, on the Sunshine Portal, we do publish them and we talk about them monthly at our Board of Trustees meetings. But where we stood in fiscal year 13 that ended June 30th of last year, overall our total sources from patient revenues, contributions and grants, other revenues through, you know, our cafeteria sales and other things, the Miners Trust Fund income, Last year, we made $22,108,000, essentially, okay? When you looked at the previous year, we made $23,719,000. So, you know, there was a significant difference. And one of those significant differences was really in our long-term care, where we do, remember I said, provide 10 beds for non-minors who do pay um, through Medicaid or cell, and 
that had gone down to just three residents. That equated over you know, about a million dollars alone in allowing that gap of seven. So you know, we've done some things, and one of the biggest things I wanted to make sure, because we want to provide services for our miners throughout the state, and many of the miners throughout the state you know, may not choose to come for long-term care services who are in Grants or in Silver City down in Roswell, as they don't want to leave their loved ones or their spouse. So if their spouse also wants to come, they have a priority on that list that they can come for self-pay or through the Medicaid program too. So we've seen an increase in that utilization. Again, keeping families together is very important. On the expense side, we did some things to contain costs, but in the end, you know, our payroll is, you know, $12,358,000. Supplies and other operating, you know, $4.2 million. Contractual services, so that's where we have to pay for temporary or the physicians or for agency or temporary nurses because we don't have enough nurses. You know, that was uh, 4.2 million just in agency cost alone for nurses. We paid $1.3 million for temporary nurses. That's a very large number for this size organization. And we'll talk a little bit about why that occurred. And it has occurred for several years. Um, depreciation, you always put that in. You know, that was up. 1.8 or almost 1.9 million dollars in depreciation for not only the building but our equipment and then interest expense. So, you know, total funds for expenses was 23,230,000 for the previous or fiscal year 13. And when you compare the other slide, if you add in depreciation, we lost 1.2 million dollars. The state doesn't recognize depreciation, so in the end, we, we show it a profit of 760000 But I always tell my team, and I'm telling the community, any business, you always factor in your depreciation because you need to fund for building on the next things. So just to stress, you know, the community benefit of Miners Colfax Medical Center. Obviously, we provide a significant impact to the regional economy. Um, you know, we're a major employer and purchaser of goods and services. We buy a lot of goods and services locally, and we strive to make sure we're doing as much locally as we can. Um, and, you know, again, across the country, hospitals continue to be a major contributor. We employ, you know, 244 healthcare professionals. As I said, our total uh, payroll is 12,358,000. And that creates a lot of other jobs that we'll talk about also as they talk indirect. So this just shows direct and indirect. And what it does, it uses a national um, formula that shows based on those wages, the indirect, because people pay for their mortgage, their rent, utilities, buy clothes locally, pay for those type of things that equated to about 10.2 million. Um, and supplies, what we did with gross receipts tax and so on. You know, that makes an economic impact of, you know, almost $32.5 million for this region, which is, again, very significant. A couple capital projects I wanted to share. You know, we are not only worked on, but will be doing this coming year, not only to advance our services, to provide you know, better comprehensive things that we can do. And radiology, it was through appropriations right now at legislation for $1.2 million in new radiology equipment. We're looking to purchase a new CT or CAT scanner, nuclear medicine, advancing our ultrasound technology, and looking at mammography in-house. And surgery. We are going to be purchasing new equipment of a little over $200,000 for advanced laparoscopy and, and other things in our surgery department. The electronic health record, which is mandated at the federal level, you know, it's not cheap. 
you know, adjust when we did our migration and upgrade for our electronic health record, which will be great, and you know, making sure we're integrated not only in the acute care, but the clinics and our long-term care facility that equated over $600,000 just for that system. And you continually have to maintain it. A thing coming down the road, you know, people may have heard meaningful use stage one and two. What does that mean? So we're, we're in stage one and we're going to stage two soon. And what it means is a big component will be patient access. So you'll be able to go through a portal that's secure and you can only get to to look at specific labs and specific information on your health care so you can be a better participant in your health care. And then we're again looking to build and bring in more uh, capital items for our respiratory and cardiovascular program. The future of health care, because really no one knows what's, where it's, it's going to go in five years, right? Everyone's out there prognosticating. But there are significant changes, and we know that. You know, healthcare reimbursement, both at the state and federal levels, continued to be concerned, not only for MCMC, but all healthcare throughout the nation. The federal government continues to reduce their Medicare and Medicaid payments, not only to hospitals and healthcare, but to practitioners. Um, uncompensated care, because of the recession and other factors continues to rise. And it will continue to rise for the foreseeable future. You know, over the last several years, we've seen those numbers dramatically <coughs> spike on the actual cost, because you know, it costs to do those tests. And what we do in uncompensated care just last year, $2.9 million. That is a very large number for this size organization. But we always look to the future and what do we have to do to make sure we're meeting the needs of the community, meeting all those pillars and progressing and being sustainable. So this past year we sat down with community members, with our board of trustees, with our leadership team and with Mr. Paul Jenkins facilitation and guidance and developed this strategic plan so for 2015 through 18, we will be looking at behavioral health. There's a very large gap in this region of behavioral health. So by the end of fiscal year 2018, we want to establish a regional behavioral health program with community partners. And I stress with community partners, we won't do it solo. We can't do it solo to provide comprehensive behavioral health services, including chemical dependency across the continuum of care. The career pathways and mentoring that I discussed, we need to further develop and expand our career pathways and mentor programs beginning at that middle school level and include potential careers in all aspects of healthcare. So we'll continue to work on that um, through 18, but really focusing and getting it rolling in 2015. Customer service. We want to be that center of exceptional customer service as measured by NRC Picker Survey. And with a rating above the 60th percentile in recommending MCMC and overall satisfaction by the end of 2015. And this audience may say 60th percentile, that's not very high. But again, it's recommending the hospital. And on a national average, you know, we're right now, to be honest, about the 40th percentile. So we need to make sure we're moving forward and taking those steps. Eventually, we will, by 2018, be in the 90th percentile. But we need to take those steps and have attainable goals. Finances. Strengthening our financial position of MCMC, we want to improve efficiency in our billing system. And with a positive cash flow by the end of 2015 and a 2% operating margin by the end of 16. Again, as I talked, you know, with depreciation, we showed a $1.1 million loss. <clears throat> so that's why it's important that we make sure we're strong financially and moving forward. 
government collaboration, and it is true collaboration, but needing to educate our legislature, or, um, legislators and government agencies regarding all of our initiatives, how they can make sure they're supporting not only our needs, but the needs of our region on health and wellness. And then pulmonary, by the end of 2015, we want to create, and we do say world renowned, so that's a big goal. Uh, by recognized throughout our pulmonary facility, attracting patients throughout the United States with 80 patient visits per month for our rehabilitation program in pulmonary. So that is a big, big goal, but it's very attainable. Staffing, again, committing to our team and making sure by the end of 2015, designing that recruitment and retention program to maintain our, group, our core team of healthcare professionals in the Raton Basin. Reducing turnover rate to 10%, and right now we are about 18% turnover rate. And reducing our agency costs by 50%. And that's why before I used that number of $1.3 million just in agency costs. So that's an important goal for us, again, to be financially strong. So team training, create a comprehensive team training program for all of our employees, including our managers, that will develop exceptional quality skills in all levels, and we'll implement that by the end of 2015. And then our outpatient services, as we talk about our clinics and expanding, develop a comprehensive primary and specialty care program based on evidence-based medicine and efficient management practices designed to meet our customers' health and wellness needs. So really looking at the new models out there on primary and specialty care and making sure we're meeting those advanced goals. So, the future of healthcare. Accountable Care Act. Again, it's here, it's going to stay. So we really need to adjust and make sure we're meeting those needs within the new parameters. One of those are, through the expansion, is what we've done is certified four navigators. And those individuals are experts in helping people through the healthcare exchange, through Medicaid enrollment, and getting them in the right places and getting them with the proper insurance. Because one of the benefits of the state of New Mexico expanding Medicaid, there's better prevention uh, or preventative medicine. So access to primary care. So making sure those customers, remember the bad debt, those people without insurance that we wrote off $2.9 million, getting them enrolled in the right programs. So they do have access, so they're not visiting the ER for their primary care. Medicaid expansion, as I said, for our county, we are looking to expand about 3,000 people just in the Medicaid program alone. That doesn't include the health exchange where they forecast about 3,500 people that it will be eligible for you know, the very uh, low cost exchange access. Soul community, we receive and a lot of hospitals throughout the state of New Mexico, it's called Soul Community Money. And what that means for Soul Community Hospitals, there's no other health care for 35 miles in your state. You get the special funding based on uncompensated care. Now, we were receiving truly about $700,000 from the state. Many organizations were receiving millions. And the problem is that program is going away as we know it, and it's changing. We'll see how it will evolve. Um, we weren't relying on it all, but we need to be tuned in and educate to make sure we're still getting our needs met with the intent of that program. So that will be evolving throughout this session, and we'll be doing a lot of education again at Santa Fe. Regulatory and reporting requirements, it continues to expand, which is a good thing in many regards where state and federal governments require that we report on a lot of different health metrics. But it requires a lot of personnel, 
a lot of time to pull that data together and report it. And it's going to be tied to your payment, which is very important. So if you're not reporting or if your metrics aren't meeting the standards, you get penalties on payments, which are already decreasing. Community-based health. And I say those words, community-based health. So it needs to be providing health and wellness at the community level. And that's what we're really trying to evolve to in meeting those health and wellness needs. So you'll see more come on that. That includes a medical home. And what that is, is if you're a customer of a certain practitioner, that practitioner manages you and tries to make sure they're meeting all of your needs even while you're at home. So follow up calls, making sure you're checking your insulin, making sure you're taking your heart medication and there's no issues to make sure you don't have to come to the ER or see them on a frequent basis. Then throughout the nation and especially here in rural northeastern New Mexico, the healthcare professional shortage. You know, again, back to the $1.3 million I keep bringing up for our nurses. It was just not this area though. I talked to the CEO for Parkview and he talks about the same thing. They use a lot of agency nursing because they have staffing issues as they bring in new RNs or other healthcare professionals. They get experience and then they go to Denver. So, you know, we see that domino effect. So we want to make sure we're keeping people here and showing how exceptional our organization is and what a great employer we are. Then decrease reimbursement and penalties that we did talk about. So those are things that we're very tuned into and trying to make sure we're addressing looking towards the future. The Rural Health Clinic, because we've talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to expand and answer any questions at the end of the session. But our rural health clinic, we are going to, and we are in the design phase right now of primary care and specialty care clinic that will be attached to the hospital. Making sure and looking at a very modern facility our customers can access and meet all those needs for primary and specialty care. So this past year we did go down and this hospital was built in 2007 and used funds through bonds. That's how it was funded. We looked at those and at that time there was a high interest rate or higher interest rate on those bonds. We thought this was a perfect opportunity to refinance those bonds, save you know, about uh, $1.3 million over the life of the bonds, and access an additional $3.2 million in new capital to build the rural health so that's what we did and we sat before you know the state finance board they approved everything and thought it was a great plan so ultimately right now we still with that additional three million dollars have 14 million dollars in a bond and that was a private placement at a very low interest rate the great thing is we didn't extend the payment periods at all it's still the original payment pay time or that will pay it off in 2027 but we we're able to access that for our clinic this is just conceptual we're right now in what they call schematic design we're going to start in february on what they call design development so putting detail into those blocks and best flow as for where the clinic should be and around the customer and again the design will be what we call patient centered making sure we go to the patient, the patient doesn't just scramble around and go to all the other areas. And there will be more detail on this. Our intent is to break ground in May for the clinic, and it will take us 10 months to build. So we're very excited about that. I briefly touched on behavioral health, and that is one of our strategic initiatives. So again, there is a changing landscape for behavioral health services in New Mexico. You know, you see the headlines that they did the audit, shut down 15 different behavioral health providers, so that created a mass void. We want to make sure, and even before that, there was a gap. So 
we are doing a feasibility study currently on what we should be doing for behavioral health with the community and cooperation with other partners. So for inpatient, outpatient, and that chemical dependency. And there is community involvement and striving, working with STOA, or SOI, working with the schools, working with uh, Tri-County on how we can develop this. And that feasibility study should come out in March on which direction we want to go. Another thing I did want to talk about again is legislative education. So making sure we're educating all of our you know, legislative representatives on the need for expanded health care in our region. Making sure that they understand the need to make, we provide competitive wages for our region. And I stress, we are a state agency, state agency, so we are, you know, constrained in some facets in what we can do for wages. So we want to make sure we're trying to expand that and meet the market. We want to support different health care initiatives, specifically prevention, expanding what we are doing in the community on prevention, creating more on healthy child. There's the more we can do early on, the better it is in the long run. Again, addressing behavioral health, and then nursing education specifically and, and recruitment. So those are big initiatives, and if anyone has questions, and if they know or have contacts and want to participate in that education, please contact me, and I have great talking points. So I did want to talk a little bit also, because. Another exciting venture this last year was working with the Raton Economic Basin team. Um, it includes Colfax, Werfano, and Las Animas. Our purpose is to strengthen economic prospects for our region. So knowing we can't do everything alone. And Mr. Paul Jenkins is also part of that, right Paul? Um, and as a healthcare, you know, we are a large contributor as I talked before. You know, not only economically, but again, how we can improve the prospects, bringing in businesses. So our goal is to strengthen and expand services for that Raton Basin region, create more career opportunities, enhance training and, uh, for organizations and communities, and then increase overall access to health care. So, you know, again, one example I'll give. We can bring orthopedics in independently, but we can work with Walsenburg, we can work with Trinidad and collaborate on those different projects. Just because the state line's there, we have to work together and make sure we're meeting all of our community's needs. There's about 35,000 throughout that entire region. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. 35,000 consumers. And, and customers. So, I did want to talk a little bit about our foundation also. We have two foundations for the hospital, then the Northeastern New Mexico Medical Community Foundation. It's a very important foundation, a foundation that assists with recruitment and retention of area healthcare practitioners. The funding is through generous community members, and to date we've raised over $100,000. And it does help as we try to bring different physicians, practitioners in this region, not only paying for travel expenses, but to give sign-on bonuses or relocation and moving expenses that the state does not allow. So that gives us that opportunity to make sure, again, we're being competitive and meeting those needs. So through that living giving tree, that gorgeous mural right down the hallway, people give different amounts from you know, $25 to $20 million. I'm still waiting for the $20 million. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, but there's two avenues for that, the, the donation directly to the hospital foundation or to the auxiliary foundation. So it's a great opportunity to help the um, organization provide that recruitment assistance. So with that, 
I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn Wiseman, our auxiliary president, who will give her annual report.